I wanted to start by talking about what you are talking about. So again, I'm referring back to the CIO survey um, that, that many of you, I'm sure, took part in. Uh, and I've got four statistics that will, make, that will then shape the remainder of the presentation. There's four things that I want to talk about. The first of those is 75% of you cited in connectivity infrastructure, brackets, the network, as a barrier still to be overcome when deploying IoT solutions. You've heard a huge amount about security today. I think there are a number of mega trends in the industry at the moment, and the three that I tend to talk about when I'm talking to, to you guys are cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and sustainability. CEO respondents already actively seeking opportunities to incorporate AI into the business. Have we mentioned AI today? Can someone remind me? And then almost all of you, and I think Bob used this stat earlier, almost all of you say that, that you have a, a voice in your company's overall, and it should be underlined actually, I should have probably underlined that word. This is not about IT sustainability, although that is part of it. You guys do need to keep your own houses in order. It's how IT can impact overall organizational sustainability. All of our connectivity solutions are under a banner of intelligent connectivity. So if you as our customers have, or are going to have, or have worked with us in the past on connectivity, as in networking solutions, congratulations, you are a Logicalis intelligent connectivity customer. What is intelligent connectivity? This is a bit of an eye chart. Don't worry, I'm gonna walk you through this very, very quickly. When we talk about networking, we talk about it in three key domains. I'd group those as the campus, wired access. Okay, campus wired ethernet is, is a pretty basic technology. It's been around for a long time. Wi-Fi access, and I'm gonna be very deliberate here, Wi-Fi, not wireless. In your campus environments, in a building like this, notwithstanding that it's a listed building, you will be able to use Wi-Fi technologies to provide connectivity. Wireless, in my opinion, refers to a broader set of technologies. Wi-Fi is included as a subset of, wi of, of wireless, but so are technologies like private 5G. So are technologies like Bluetooth, emerging technologies like NOcean or Zigbee or any, anyone, you know, Cisco Curb, for example. There's a lot of wireless technologies. Our mission in life in that campus environment, which is those first three boxes, is wherever you need to provide connectivity to whatever things you want to connect, and increasingly, by the way, those will be previously unconnected things. This is not about laptops or servers or, or, or smartphones. This is about coffee machines and car park barriers. So that's domain number one, the campus. Domain number two, the software defined WAN, okay? And again, SD is, is a dominant set of technologies now actually across all of these. Uh, SD-WAN providing, using a variety of underlying, underlying bandwidths, and usually that will involve the internet overlaying a software-defined construct on top and providing SD-WAN services. And then the third domain is the data center. So if we can connect all of those domains together, and then the big box at the bottom, really important, is underpin those with that embedded security, then we're probably onto, onto a winner. What we then do is wrap all of those solutions in a, a model of services and support, everything from person in a van break fix services through specific assessment services, advisory services, uh, CX services, so adoption services, making sure that you're getting the most out of your, you know, your investment, right the way up to and including around the edge service management and full blown managed services. That in a nutshell is the building blocks of what we call intelligent connectivity. What does your network need to look like going forward? Okay, and there are a few attributes here that I want to talk about. Pretty obvious, right? Capacity. Your network needs to have enough capacity, enough bandwidth to support whatever you're going to throw at it in terms of applications and again, connecting the unconnected, et cetera, et cetera. Underpin that with reliability and resilience. Okay, and that might mean platform level, making sure that the individual platforms that you use to build that network are inherently reliable in their own right, but also underpinning that with topological resilience. So if something does happen, you know, someone outside your building puts a JCB through the main cable duct into the building, the network's intelligent enough and able to route around those problems, providing resilience so that the network is there as close to 100% of the time as possible. Scale. Well, I've already touched on this. You need that ability to be able to connect whatever you want to connect, a lot of previously unconnected technologies, wherever those technologies are, via a variety of means. The ability to be flexible in how we provide that connectivity and that scale, quite important. And then on the other side of me, the, my little virtuous circle here, three key attributes to me, agility. Okay, And what I mean by that is, and I've already kind of touched on this, Networking as a, tech, as, as, a, as a family of technologies is now completely dominated by software defined. Someone earlier talked about complexity and reducing complexity. 
let's be clear, networking is horrendously complex and more so than it ever was. What Software Defined does is reduce operational complexity. Doesn't matter how, how complex the underlying technologies are, if you hide them behind a very simple to use front end, that's great. You can, you can easily access that complexity. You don't have to dive into command lines, etc., etc. You can actually reduce your operational over, overhead considerably. Every IT customer I've ever spoken to in my career says to me they spend most of their time, most of their budget, most of their human resources doing two things, fighting fires and keeping the lights on. Unfortunately, that precludes spending time on what you should be doing, which is helping your business realise the digital outcomes that it needs to to be competitive. If we can create agility in the network, we ease that operational burden, we free up time in your teams, and you can then start to concentrate on driving digital business outcomes. So agility is really, really important. Security has to be embedded into your network fabric by design. It's no good bolting it on as an afterthought. And then kind of the other side to the same coin is observability. It's inevitable that at some point, something's gonna to happen to your network infrastructure that will create We'll call it a suboptimal condition. It might, it might be a complete outage, it might be a partial outage, it might just be a performance issue. You need to have embedded into the fabric of the network a set of telemetry, monitoring, observability, call it what you will, tools, that when you do have a suboptimal condition, you can quickly identify what it is, where it is, and then remediate it. If you can deliver all six of those things and underpin them with a sustainability strategy, what you actually achieve from a pure network perspective, do these six things, you achieve a degree of network assurance, and then when, the, when the, the inevitable, there's a problem somewhere, and what does everyone say when there's a problem? The bloody network's down. Every single time, okay, you can say, actually, you know what? No, it's not the network, it's something else. And then you concentrate on figuring out what the something else is. We build you that, we deliver that, you've now got a highly capable network assurance model, you've got the network that, that will underpin everything that you're trying to do with it. So that then raises the inevitable question, what are you gonna do with it? And there's a ton of stuff. There will be stuff that you know about, there will be stuff that you have planned for, but there'll also be those curveballs that will come around the corner, you know, it might be six months or 18 months or whenever down the line, your CEO comes into the office and goes, I've just had a brilliant idea. Historically, IT would have often said, yeah, yeah, we never really sort of thought about that use case, so no, you can't do that. And the CEO would go, oh, bloody IT. Every time we ask them to do anything useful, they say no. Our mission in life is to turn that no into a yes. IoT, the Internet of Things, has been being talked about, has been around for 10, 15 plus years, okay? It's now gone from a science project to mainstream, deliverable, production-grade technologies. IoT manifests itself in many, many different ways. If you are a retailer, your IoT journey will be fundamentally different than if you are a manufacturer, if you are a university, if you're a police force. You can't just generically say, we're gonna go to market with IoT, because it means too many different things to too many different people. What you can do, though, is find use cases that are a little bit broader than just retail or just a university. And for us, we chose to look at smart building. So smart buildings are a, you know, a, a series of technologies that are brought together on a common backbone, which will be the IT network, by the way. Okay? Um, those technologies are then able to integrate with one another, interact with one another to the benefit of those people using that environment. What I would call core systems, so the building mechanic and electrical systems, lighting, HVAC, elevators, escalators, smart blinds, etc. Physical security systems, so cameras, access control, asset tracking, alarm systems, etc., and then user experience systems, wayfinding, digital signage, space optimization and booking, environmental monitoring. Um, if you can pull all those together, and again, back to the shameless plug for the network that sits underneath all of this and underpins it, the secure, observable, agile network, then you can deliver potentially a smart building. There are many smart building use cases. This is a good subset of them. I'm sure there are others as well. Most of those customers are starting with one use case. So we land a single smart building use case, and then you land and expand from that, and you can then start to implement others. I've got a question for the audience. Does anyone know what is the difference between a blueberry muffin and a chihuahua? Well, as it turns out, not a lot. <laughs> so what you can see here is a number of blueberry muffins and a number of chihuahuas. We can distinguish. Does anyone want to say they can't distinguish between them? Probably not, right? We can distinguish relatively easily between a blueberry muffin and a chihuahua. An AI engine may not be able to do so quite so easily. AI is all about the data. If you want to, if you want to inform and teach an AI engine, you've got to throw data at it in, a, in huge volumes and accurate, reliable, 
you know, quality data. If you do that, how do you, how do you differentiate between a blueberry muffin and a chihuahua? You throw a shitload of blueberry muffin and chihuahua data at your, at, your, um, at your AI engine and it will learn. If it's properly architected, it will learn. Cisco, our partner for today, have unmatched data sets. So when we talk about AI in the context of you guys and delivering AI in your environment, AI ops, and by the way, there are other manifestations as well, you need to feed that data to it. Cisco, for example, the Talos database, the largest non-governmental threat intelligence database in the world. AI has obviously huge relevance for operations, but it also has huge relevance for business as well. Task automation, so again, in, in the AI ops world, that might be applying new, you know, automatically applying a different quality of service or reliability or security policy to the network. Data analysis is the big one. And the scary one, AI is now generating lots of content, including, rather worryingly, AI engines are now beginning to code. AI writing software code. Slightly worrying. This is a General Electric jet engine. If you're interested, it's a PW1000G jet engine. It has over 5,000 sensors on board. This is one engine, okay? When it's running, it's delivering telemetry at a rate of greater than 10 gigabits per second. And by the way, brackets, Anyone seen a one engine or one engine jet airliner recently? Nah, no. So there's at least two of these on, on each of those uh, airplanes, probably four. That is a screenshot of Flight Radar 24, which is an online website that will show you every airliner in the air at any particular moment. Okay, every one of those little yellow dots is an airplane. Every one of those airplanes has at least two of those, if not four. Do the maths. You're into at least exabytes of data per day, maybe even zettabytes. Splunk now, so Cisco have acquired Splunk. Why did Cisco spend $28 billion on Splunk? This is why, the data problem. So Splunk is now emerging as Cisco's data platform. As I've already mentioned, you can't throw humans at the problem anymore. Sustainability. When I talk about sustainability and IT-driven sustainability, sustainability in the supply chain, and that is things like using you know, more efficient materials, less packaging. When you buy a Cisco switch router uh, access point now, you get far less packaging than you used to. More importantly though, um, to IT take-back programs. Cisco have an IT take-back program. They will take your old technologies, remove them free of charge, and ethically recycle them or repurpose them. So that's all supply chain. The bit in the middle is the obvious bit. This is IT keeping its own house in order. Number of examples in there. Um, this will sound obvious. If you buy a new piece of IT technology, it will generally be faster than the old piece of IT, IT technology that it's replacing. You wouldn't buy a slower one. What's not as, as immediately obvious is not only will it be faster, but it will be more power efficient. When a device is not in use, an access point, for example, has nothing associated with it, put it asleep. Put it in a low power mode. Last point, consequential energy savings. This is how IT can impact energy usage in other systems. Simple example, okay? The, build, the, uh, the room is unoccupied, a sensor on the network tells you the room is unoccupied, turn the lights off. The room is not booked, turn off the heating. Data centers, so I spoke to a customer literally last week, they had uh, equipment in a colo data center. The colo provider have now said, we're gonna raise the ambient temperature in that data center from 22 degrees to 27 degrees. Is that okay for your equipment? because by raising that temperature, you reduce the burden on the AC system dramatically, reduce the energy consumption of that, a of that AC system dramatically, and in doing so, save a huge amount of energy and improve your carbon footprint. And I'll pause for breath.